I forgot that. So um, welcome, guys. Welcome really to another episode of Nurses Outside the Box and with Melissa Batchelor. Melissa, you have so many different things that you've done in your life. You're a scientist, you're a nurse, you are an author, right? It's, it's you're a scholar in so many ways, and you've done so many things in your life. So it's such an honor to have you here. So welcome, first and foremost. Thank really. you. No, I think this is a great thing that you're doing. Well, we need to have more examples of nurses who are doing something extraordinary. So going back to your story, can you tell us a little bit more about your story and, and what has led you to all the things that, that you have done so far? I would love for you to highlight some of the things you've done that are a little bit outside the box and, and yeah, tell us a little bit about your story, but how did it all start? <laughs> so how it all started is I was filling out my college application and it said major, and I really didn't think I should put supermodel in there. <laughs> <laughs> so I asked my dad what I should put in there and he was like you should put down nursing and I was like really it's like you think that would be a good thing for me to do And he goes yeah I think you'd be really good at it so started off in college as a nurse actually quit school for a little bit ended up being taken to New York with a modeling agency but then I decided that I really liked to eat and <laughs> so I came back and decided I couldn't be a model and kind of how that all comes you know um to where I'm at now is that when, so I became a nurse in geriatrics, I've only ever worked in nursing homes and long-term care, which is highly unusual for a nurse. Most people think of nurses working in a hospital, like at the bedside. Mm -hmm. And that's never been what I've done. I mean, I've done bedside care, but at uh, in skilled nursing homes, mm -hmm. then I became a nurse practitioner and was able to go into lots of different um, long-term care settings and provide care as a family nurse practitioner. Mm -hmm. And then became an academic and thought, what am I going to do for my PhD? And I decided that I like to eat and I like to take care of older adults with Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. And so now that's been my area of research is developing the science behind three different hand feeding techniques that people can use for um, increasing meal intake and minimizing behaviors for someone that has Alzheimer's disease by optimizing sensory motor cues. We already know to give verbal and visual cues and adding these hand feeding techniques maintains their independence uh, for as long as possible, promotes dignity, um, and it's just another way to communicate with them that it's time to eat when they've lost language ability. And so bringing back you know, a lot of the stuff that I wanted to do earlier in my career with you know, being in front of the camera, but also having wanting to have a very important message um, so that's kind of how I've gotten into the podcasting stuff myself. I did a hand feeding demonstration video so that people could see the different um, hand feeding techniques and, um, and find them. And that has helped um, with the dissemination of those. I've had a lot of people that, has, that have found that video and then asked permission to put it into their training programs. And so that's been, so it all kind of came full circle from that one question asking my dad like what I should do. Um, but I love being a nurse and it is a career it's not a job. And so there's all these opportunities to kind of reinvent yourself and follow your passion and do good in the world. Absolutely. I'm curious, why geriatrics? Why did you choose to do, go that, that route? <laughs> Another story. So <laughs> I, my, this is actually, the Johnny Hartford Foundation actually made this into a video, this story. And I was the girl that sat on the front steps of the School of Nursing. And at that point, this was in like 94, 95, 96. And we did not, I did not have anybody in my School of Nursing that was, had expertise in geriatrics. And the message was, you should go work in the hospital. So I used to sit on the front steps of the school of nursing and I was like, I don't care what I'm going to do. I don't care what I do, but I'm never going to work with older adults. And I'm definitely not going to work in the nursing home. And about <laughs> third, about a month before graduation, my mom called me up and said, Hey, I've met this administrator at a local nursing home and she wants to hire you as an administrative nurse. So that meant I was like, my first job in nursing was in an administrative position. Um. And I tell people I kind of started at the top and worked my way back down because I was the quality improvement nurse, went into, uh, was a DON, the director of nursing, within four months of having my nursing license. Not really what I would recommend. So at 23, I was running a 125-bed <laughs> facility. Uh, then went into the MDS, the minimum data set or care plan coordinator role, and then um, got married, had my first child, and back my way down into being a weekend um, floor supervisor. So kind of start at the top, work my way down. And then um, 
also, and then became a nurse practitioner. So, and I actually became a family nurse practitioner thinking that would be my chance to like get out of geriatrics. Yeah. But the only time I got fired up is if we were talking about something that had to do with aging. And at the end of the day, I had a choice between women's health and geriatrics. And to me, geriatrics, they are the most challenging group of people. So I knew that I would never be bored. I mean, if you have 20 medications and 20 diagnoses and a lifetime of experience, I mean, these are really cool people with great and amazing stories. So I was like, okay, I'm stuck. This is just what I'm going to do forever. And so that's how I got into aging. And what's the, what's the best part about it? What's the best part about being involved in geriatric nursing? Because I think you have such a heart for that, right? And I mean, I'm curious also about the, the whole thing about going to the, the spoon, the hand feeding, right? How you got into those. So kind of those two questions I'd love to have. What, what, what is the most exciting food part about it? And, and why specific doing the hand feeding techniques? Why go get, get into that? So I think for me, um, the most ex exciting part about geriatric nursing is the complexity of it. And there, there was a lot of autonomy in the skilled nursing home. Yeah. And it's also a skill, it's, it's a, a pocket of knowledge that not a lot of people have. I mean, out of 4 million nurses in the United States, less than 2% are board certified in geriatrics. Mm. But if you look at the demographics, over 60% of the people in hospital beds are over 65. So it's it, it, by default, we're all geriatric nurses. And I would even have students, they would say, well, you know, I'm gonna work in mother baby. I'm like, right. So you're gonna need skill sets for when that grandparent comes in with a little, maybe a little cognitive impairment, maybe some functional issues. You're gonna to have to adapt the care to meet the emotional needs of that person and you know the, the mom and the baby so mm -hmm. grandparents mm -hmm. um, so to me I mean I see aging everywhere and it's always exciting um, to me to see things it gives you a little bit different lens and of the geriatric we had like 7,000 geriatricians I think we're down to like 6,400 so mm -hmm. it's just not a popular specialty um, and we just need more people um, in this area so to me, I think that's probably the most exciting part is to, to be able to really solve problems with mm -hmm. the, the special education and training that you have, you know, when you're board certified in geriatrics and have dedicated your career to doing that, you can really make a difference just by sharing that information and knowledge. Yeah, no, I love it. And so, and so then the hand feeding techniques, why? why specifically there because i think that's very unique right and also the movies or no, not the movies the kind of the, the instructional videos that you've made with that as well right it's like mm -hmm. why that so i knew when i did my interview for um to do my phd I had like an hour-long conversation with dr elena mella and she ended up being my dissertation chair but we talked for an hour about how we should not be putting feeding tubes in nursing home residents and so I already knew that I wanted to study meal times. you know, looking, there are a lot of people that work in long-term care that don't know how to manage um, probably not really pro or challenging behaviors. We could just call them behaviors. Um, and there are a lot of things that we do as caregivers that actually cause those behaviors. So being able to teach people how to approach someone the right way was important, making sure that we aren't putting feeding tubes in people. And because hand feeding is recommended over two feeding until death for someone that has you know, dementia. And while you might think it's like such a, and it is basic nursing care. And, but we have, we just kind of feed people the way we think that they're supposed to be fed. And so it's mostly spoon feeding someone. And when you have a cognitive impairment, your vision, you have, you have a loss of peripheral vision. You can't hear as well you have lost language ability, so you cannot use or understand language, but what do we do as caregivers? We do a lot of talking. Mm -hmm. And the Palmer reflex comes back. And so if you've ever shaken somebody's hand with advanced Alzheimer's, they will squeeze your hand. And it's just because that reflex comes back and they can't let go. So all of those things interfere with your ability to feed yourself. And I went, I took a group of students back in like 2007 to a fit caregiver training session on a weekend and Tipa Snow was there. And Tipa was with the um, Alzheimer's Association of North Carolina. Mm -hmm. And I remember being in this breakout session 
And Melanie Bunn, who was a nurse practitioner that I had worked with before I went to UNCW um, to be a lecturer, she demonstrated this underhand technique. And when you do the underhand technique as the person that's being assisted, not as the caregiver, when you feel the difference between overhand and underhand, I was like, if someone puts, if they do overhand the way that the person did it for me, it felt like they were pushing my hand towards my face. And I instinctively just wanted to push them away because those instincts and reflexes, those remain intact. Mm -hmm. But if I were a nursing home resident and I pushed you away, caregivers interpret that as resistance, but it was just a natural reflex. Well, then the caregiver gets up and walks off and the little person's left there to try to fend for themselves. When you do the underhand technique, it frees up your skill fingers. You have to have these three fingers to be able to write and to hold a utensil. Mm -hmm. So the underhand technique allows me to tap into that palmer reflex, frees up my skill fingers, and then I can do that part for the person. But when you experience it, it feels like you have control over it and that you have, um, that you initiated that movement. Mm -hmm. And this is a movement we've associated with eating our entire life. So while you might not understand me telling you it's time to eat, if we scoop the food up and I help you move it towards your mouth, mm -hmm. most times people open their mouth. So, And you know, it's funny because I saw your video on LinkedIn and I tried it and it's, it was so true. It really felt very, very different if, if somebody, yeah, in, in the normal way that I've been used to it and the underhand way. I was like, wow. And so what happened is once I, because when I experienced it the first time, I was like, this is how we should be doing it. Like, how could nobody have, like, how come I didn't know about this? And my first thought was, how do we get this into the evidence-based guidelines? So I asked Melanie, I was like, who made up this or who developed this? And she's like, well, Tipa did. So I went and asked Tipa, I was like, where is the science for this? And at the time, you know, Tipa was um, probably in her sixties. And she's like, yeah, I, I know this works. So it's basically, it's practice-based evidence and I asked her, I said, would you mind if I do the science and help establish that? And she was like, you go for it. So from practice-based evidence, now I've done the first experimental study comparing the three different hand feeding techniques and um, run a clinical trial and that type of stuff. But now we have evidence-based practice. So this year, it's taken this long, the full kind of um, information and background about the changes that happen in Alzheimer's disease and how to do this hand feeding um, you know, in, the, in a better way than what we're doing right now, where we don't give people cues, we tend to stand over people, and then you know, the food just shows up in your mouth. Right. Well, I don't know about you, but last time food showed up in my mouth that I don't remember putting there or didn't have a clue that it was coming, you're gonna spit it out. And that's another behavior that gets interpreted as resistance. Mm -hmm. So it was kind of this moment in time where she's like, you help establish the science. And I was like, that's what I'm going to do for my PhD. I mean, that's so for my dissertation. I designed a hand feeding training program for nursing home staff. And while I could tell them about the hand feeding techniques, I couldn't make any recommendations about how or when to use each one because I didn't know. And so for my postdoc, I did the study where we compared the three different hand feeding techniques. And so now I have at least the beginning of some guidelines about how you make those decisions and the spoon feeding should be safe for last. So when someone is bedridden and you start with, you know, overhand, then you move to direct to the underhand and then you save direct hand for last. Nice. Nice. What do you see in the future? Where are you going to go next with this? I assume more publicity, more, right. But where do you want to lead this? So for me, I want it to be, um, in every, so this is where the, kind of the policy interest comes, how nursing research makes its way into policy. You know, I want these hand feeding techniques in every single entry level nursing assistant curriculum, as well as licensed nurses, because licensed nurses, while you may not, might not be helping with a meal, you can use these techniques with medication, like doing medication administration. You can use this to help somebody brush their teeth, comb their hair. You do all the fine motor stuff so that we're engaging the person in care instead of just doing to them. So in every nursing assistant curriculum, you know, every school of nursing, OTPT, I want it, I want family caregiver training. You know, that's another um, critical piece. AARP actually let me do a video um, 
probably a little over a year ago on the hand feeding techniques for family caregivers as part of their Home Alone Alliance. They have a series of how-to videos. And so there's six videos within the special diets. Um, and so, the, so that was the first video that I got to do for family caregivers. So it's mm -hmm. not just for nursing home staff. It's not just for hospital staff. Um, we have a lot of people that are going, you know, meal times is always a very emotional problem when people are losing weight and they're not eating. And if you know how to maximize and op or optimize the cues, so I call this, I call this intervention NOSH. You have to have a word that means to eat, but it stands for nurses optimizing supportive hand feeding. Oh, nice. but it's, a, it's a game changer for people. And they go, that is so simple, but so profound. Mm -hmm. And it makes such a difference. So helping, giving people this, this, the information, the tools they need, because everybody loves to eat. We do this three times a day, yeah. sometimes more, you know, and then there's snacks. So um, it's a great way to bond emotionally. So beautiful. What did you say to nurses who are listening to this and who are either interested in this or really in the whole innovation of geriatric nursing, right? What would you say to, to nurses who are listening? Um, that they're in a great field, you know, um, I, I want people to be able to, I want nurses to be able to share our unique knowledge and our unique voice within the conversation of healthcare in general. Um, it's something that nursing hasn't done a great job at. Mm -hmm. And, um, so I want us to kind of find our voice mm -hmm. and, and the skills, some of the basic nursing skills that we know how to do, family caregivers need that skill set. And almost everyone is impacted by taking care of family. You know, I'm um, in the next 10 years, we're going to have more older adults than kids on the planet, but even teaching somebody little things, you know, how do you modify a home to help somebody age in place? Um, you know, how do we move from a healthcare system of illness focus to prevention? That's nursing's role. And, you know, nurse practitioners, you know, is to help, to help educate people about how to stay healthy, how to prevent, these illnesses, how to stay out of the hospital. Um, so I would say content, go to school for as long as you can. Mm -hmm. you know, I obviously I did, you know, um, you don't do it all at one time. So I, I can remember looking at other people, like other faculty CVs, like when I was a doctoral student and I was like, oh my gosh, like they did like a postdoc. And what you have to realize is it was over a long period of time, you know. Um, so awesome. that's kind uh, of what I would want people to do. Is any nurses who say, I really love this, this whole hand feeding technique and I want to get involved in that. Is there a way to do that at this point or is that in the future? So the, so the hand feeding video, you can find it on my website at melissabphd.com backslash nosh. So you can find the video there. I'm currently um, working on trying to develop an online um, training program that anyone can take. Um, I did co-develop a train the trainer program with the state of Texas, Texas Health and Human Services. So every nursing home in the state of Texas has access to that training. Um, but you can take the training, but the, the video is online, it's free. You can share it, you know, show it to a group of, of staff and then just practice it. If you have any questions, you're welcome to give me, you know, contact me. If there's anyone that wants to get their PhD, we have a PhD program at George Washington where I'm faculty and would always love to have students um, in, you know, interested in studying aging, meal times, Alzheimer's care, um, anything age friendly. So. Awesome. Awesome. Well, and definitely you'll put those websites and everything down below as well as this video so people can reach out to you. Thanks so much, Melissa. This is, this is amazing. Uh, you've had a phenomenal career and I think it's, it's only the beginning of what you still want to do, right? You have, you have some amazing plans. So thanks so much for coming on. You're definitely such a nurse outside the box and um, in so many ways and you've done phenomenal stuff. So thank you. Thank you so much. I'm going to leave your last word. If you want to say anything to kind of finish this all up or anything towards nurses who are listening, uh, what would be the last word that you want to say to them? Um, I would just say we have, we are a great profession. We are what 18 years in a row. We've been voted um, most trustworthy and um, profession. And then also I think that the work that you're doing to celebrate, you know, 2020 as the year of the nurse and midwife. And so um, I just think that what you're doing is great 
and appreciate the opportunity to be with you and on this podcast. So awesome. Well, thank you. And uh, yes, please contact Melissa with any questions you have. You can find her on LinkedIn on her website as well. And uh, yeah, thanks again. All right. Thank you. There we go.